I'm going to be talking to you, uh, good morning everybody, I'll be talking to you about community-led monitoring guiding principles and, and keep in mind this is going to be very much from a UNAIDS perspective. Um, uh, community-led monitoring can be, I, I think as a methodology, can be generically used by, by, by almost anybody, but there are certain aspects um, of my presentation which you'll see which are, which are very specific to um, kind of the HIV response. Um, so First, let me take a step back. Um, and you know, we, we UNAIDS, as you may be aware, is you know works to a global strategy which is agreed by UN mem uh, member state commitments. The last political declaration was in 2021, um, and there are three kind of targets that I think we really need to keep in mind when we think of all UNAIDS programs and, and the HIV response, but but particularly with community-led monitoring, that 30% of testing and treatment services um, uh, with a focus on HIV testing linkage treatment adherence and retention support and literacy um, are, are led by communities, 80% um, of uh, HIV prevention services and 60% of programs to support the achievement of societal enablers. So what we're already setting up here in the strategies is that we want communities and community organizations to be um, to be the service providers, to be leading a lot of the activities to get us uh, over the last mile, right? To get us to our 95, 95 targets. So this word community, um, we, we use it, we bandy it about all the time and uh, lots of people have different um, uh, conceptions of what that means. Their communities are diverse and dynamic. Um, a person may be part of more than one community. Um, communities are formed by people who are connected to each other in distinct and varied ways. Um, for us, you know, obviously we're working in health, so it's about people who are who health systems are trying to reach, um, people who are affected by a given health problem, in this case HIV, um, uh, people who share specific characteristics of vulnerabilities, um, but also it can refer to the organizations that represent these people. And so, you know, since it can mean many things, we, we wanted to, to provide a little bit more definition about what we mean. So community-led organizations for us um, refers to a group of people with shared characteristics. So that, that little diagram here on the right that um, has um, you know, multiple people, um, as opposed to community-based organizations, which tend to be more um, a, a, a group of community members but who whose shared characteristic is that they are in a in a shared geography or they may actually be um um more generically kind of um uh linked and they're not in a specific geography but they, they don't necessarily they're not representative of a specific group it's more generic um so community-led organizations groups networks whether formally or informally organized are entities for for us for which the majority of the governance staff etc are made up of the constituencies that they are representing, um, that they have transparent mechanisms of accountability to those constituencies. And this is really key. Um, Community-led organizations, groups, and networks are self-determining and autonomous. Um, and, and we're finding, you know, this is a real challenge, particularly um, given some donor mechanisms. Um, so they're not influenced by governments or, um, or donor agendas. And it's just really important to recall that not all community-based organizations are actually community-led organizations. Doesn't mean that they're not doing great work or that they aren't brilliant organizations. It's just in terms of how we define things, we try to be to we try to distinguish between the two. So community-led organizations is in and of itself an umbrella term. And you can see under the umbrella here, youth-led organizations, key population-led organizations, so that can also be split out, right, in terms of uh, female sex workers, male sex workers, MSM, et cetera, um, led organizations, women-led organizations, and people living with HIV-led organizations. So it's a very diverse group when we talk about community-led organizations. But the key thing here is, is that it is led by those communities themselves with all the mechanisms, et cetera, I just referred to. So HIV community-led monitoring um, is an accountability mechanism for national HIV responses led and implemented by local community organizations, community-led organizations or people living with HIV, networks of key populations or other affected groups or community entities. Now for us, now that we've defined who, um, who needs to be leading, um, there are some other aspects. So 
community-led monitoring should be ongoing. It is a structured platform. Um, and so that involves ensuring our peer monitors are capacitated to systematically routinely collect and analyze qualitative and quantitative data. We're doing really well at the first bit there in terms of the collection, less well on the analysis, and that there are multiple reasons for that, um, including data from people in community settings who might not be accessing healthcare, establish rapid feedback loops with program managers and health decision makers. So in that in that paragraph here, we're, we're establishing that this is a this is like a parallel reporting system in addition to what we see coming out of the global AIDS monitoring, right? But it is run led by communities themselves. The data is used for monitoring trends along the HIV care cascade and to inform targeted action that will improve the quality of HIV services. So this is what this looks like in in um, in kind of diagrammatic form. Um, it's, you've got the education, evidence, engagement, and advocacy. And, and the idea here is, is that you are you are building capacity of communities um, to, to monitor and report on what's going on in their communities, but you're also building the capacity of um, health service providers, and particularly, for example, the clinics who are linked to those communities in terms of understanding what's actually going on. Um, you know, we, we know that healthcare workers are incredibly pressed for time, and sometimes RCLM programs are able to spend a little bit more time with their peers um, to, to, to find out what's actually going on. And really importantly, when you have a peer-to-peer -peer conversation, we, we believe that you can actually have a, a more fruitful conversation. You can learn more about the how, the what, and the why, as opposed to just what the, the number is, right? So essential elements are that CLM is led by communities, it's focused on action accountability, it's independent, it's collaborative. Communities can't work in isolation here. Right. You, you could imagine you have to have kind of the, the partnership with the local health facility, with the government to be able to operate. Otherwise, the feedback loop won't happen. You know, if you if the idea is, is that you you go out and with your, your monitors, you're speaking to users of services, use people in the community to understand what's actually going on, to understand um, challenges that people may be facing. If you don't have that feedback mechanism into the health facility or the government, and we'll talk a little bit about examples of that in a second, um, then it's not CLM, right? Because you, you, you're, you're just working in a vacuum. So it has to be, has to have a level of partnership and some collaboration. It's routine and systematic. And, and this is really keen for us. And this is one of the things that UNAIDS is really pushing with donors is in terms of trying to support kind of longer term thinking in terms of CLM to ensure that that capacity we've built and those monitoring systems that are showing, you know, great detail and, and helping service providers to, to improve their services, that the funding doesn't disappear next year or get cut or changed in a way that isn't reflective of the results that are coming out of the program. Um, and that these these programs are transparent with results being used for action and dissemination. So let me give some rational examples. Um, now, keep in mind, I, I, I scour to try and find more examples from this from this region, so Europe and, and Central Asia. Um, but I'm afraid I don't have any examples. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about actually examples generally. Um, but I would love to hear if, if, if you have great examples of CLM uh, taking place. But the, a few things I just want to keep in mind when we think about CLM. It's about as much about the process, about building capacity of communities, the fact that they're paid to actually do um, the monitoring work, um, as, as, as well as the outcome. So what they're reporting uh, and that feedback into hopefully the health facility and how that is improving care. It's, in, it's a, CLM is really focused around quality uh, quality of services, quality of life. And I think that's a real change from some sometimes our approach, which is more quantitative, more numbers. How do we get more people into the system? How do we get more people on prep? How do we get more people uh, on treatment? So um, I think that is a really important um, element of CLM that we, we often underemphasize. Um, it is all about optimizing investments and validating uh, data that comes out of the, the, the global AIDS monitoring data that comes out of clinics. Um, and it's also about raising awareness of human rights violations. Now, that, that may be things in clinic and stigma and discrimination that's driving um, kind of uh, poor quality of care, but it may be, um, you know, in, in the community, other, other rights abuses, uh, laws and things that are, uh, or, or policy practices um, that, that, are, that are affecting people's rights. And I've got a few examples here of um, 
you know, of how CLM in this kind of rigorous structured way um, has actually, you know, led to some results. So in, in Benin, in, in West Africa, we see here um, stockouts, um, you know, of reagents, something very simple that wasn't because of the way the systems were set up, um, able to be reported, reported back to kind of the central authorities effectively. And through the CLM program and the community partner, Rebat Plus, um, they advised the National AIDS Control Program, which then engaged with the Ministry of Health and which ensured that the, the reagents uh, were stocked up, um, were, were restocked. In South Africa, um, you know, there was um, a nice example here of 88% of people living with HIV um, disclosed that a health provider had explained the results of their viral load tests uh, in 2022, up from 77% in 2021. Um, obviously, there's quite a high base in terms of obviously treatment, awareness, etc. program reach um, in South Africa. But if you think about U equals U and, and you know, um, undetectable equals untransmissible, that's actually a 2% increase in the proportion of PLHIV um, who, who, um, who kind of, who were aware and were, because of their, their undetectable status, aware that um, if they stayed on their treatment were undetectable, um, they'd be uh, untransmissible. And then from from broadly this region in Kyrgyzstan, uh, a TB example, um, which which I'm not familiar with, this comes out of a CLM report, which is about to be published. Um, but um, TB people conducts regular CLM of TB services, including reporting human rights violations. As a result, the ministry created trust councils at TB clinics that now use CLM data to improve services. And that model of uh, that TV model. The reason why I put it in there is we're seeing in, in numbers of places. We've seen, I was in Malawi a couple of weeks ago and um, there were some great examples of how what they call the core members, which are a, a group of diverse members from the community, including MSM, um, people use drugs, female sex workers in particular, um, were, were linked into a, a government um, if you will, structure, it's a, it's a voluntary structure for communities called the health advisory councils, which are connected to clinics. And in most cases, those hacks, those health advisory councils don't do anything. But as a result of CLM programs, the core members, so the, the community partners to the CLM program are able to feed into the, 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 the hack, the, the advisory council, which is then able to feed into the clinic um, results from CLM data. And I'll give you um, one example that I was really um, uh, amazed by. So Malawi is not, um, you know, you've you've probably heard about the anti homosexuality law in in in, um, in Uganda, and there's similar um, proposals in a number of countries, and there has been on and off in Malawi as well. So it's not the greatest space for for key populations, and particularly MSM right now. And um, I was sat in a, in, a, in a group with core members and um, basically I was speaking to a gay man who was a, um, uh, a client, um, a user of services at a faith based as a Catholic sisters, uh, so an, 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 um, a convent run or a nun led um, uh, service delivery provider. And that service delivery provider had been selected because of poor performance and that's why it had been added to the CLM program. And as a result of the CLM program and the community members having the time to really talk about people's experience, the MSM experience um, at the clinic, that was fed back to the administrator who was a, a nun and the, the lead um, uh, nurse agent. And it, they, they realized that there was a problem, right? They, 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 they basically, the way they described to us is that we have to treat the person in front of us and they didn't necessarily recognize how stigmatizing and, and discriminatory some of their behaviors and actions and procedures were. Those got reformed and over the past year, um, you know, the use of that service overall has shot up. Um, it's now actually rated as a good service um, um, across Malawi, uh, one of the better services. And, two gay men spoke up in that group to say that this had gone from being a centre that they would always avoid to their preferred centre now to, to come uh, to use services just because of um, the CLM programme. Now, one of the things that I mentioned to you is we don't have any good examples, and I just gave you an example with some detail. That, that, um, that detail is reported back as... Um, improvement in MSM friendly services. Um, that, that was literally the bullet that was presented to me in terms of the reporting. 
And one of the things I think we just need to, to really work on as communities is improving our reporting of the impacts that we're having, whether that's qualitative or, or quantitative. Um, there is a story behind a lot of this data. And sometimes we are in, in our in our desire to, to, to be focused on um, implementation, we sometimes um, don't document and disseminate as effectively as we could. So this is now becoming a big focus for, for, for us at UNAIDS is helping support our partners to document the changes that they are, they are seeing on the ground as a result of CNM programs moving forward. Um, we have also, um, a, a, um, you know, there is a guide, set of guidelines establishing community-led monitoring of services, which goes into far more detail than I'm able to, to do here about CLM. So please see that. The, the link is uh, in the presentation when you receive it. Um, there's a global CLM community of practice, um, which is uh, basically a set of webinars that happen on a quarterly basis. Sometimes we have some additional where we have technical assistance providers or leading CLM implementers who do kind of deep dive sessions, learning sessions on CLM. Um, and we're linking this with more regional communities of practice, uh, particularly in Asia, where um, the team there has, has, has really got um, uh, working with the networks and, and, and country uh, implementers are, are really doing a great job at linking, disseminating learning from one another's experience. Um, there's also tools, something called the progression matrix, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and there is also technical assistance available through the technical support mechanism for, for CLM delivery. Um, and we provide direct support that some of some of US funding for CLM goes through us. Um, and we also do a lot of work, obviously coordinating donors, working with Global Fund, USG, the two main primary funders uh, of CLM to, to make sure that we're, we're not giving conflicting messages. There was a there was a meeting last year which I won't go into in great detail just because of time, but the the point I will take that I'll I want you to take away is is that CLM in many parts of the world has now been running for two or three years as CLM programs. Let's not kid ourselves. CLM is not new. Um, communities have been doing scorecards or all manner of CLM type activities for a long time. We just haven't necessarily called it CLM. But one of the things that we're trying to do, and again, back to my point about documenting our impacts, what we're trying to do is consolidate the evidence, right? Really try and demonstrate how CLM is already in a couple of years um, showing um, impact and ensuring that we follow the guidance as much as possible, particularly that first bit about ensuring communities are leading this work, because this is this is the big opportunity for CLM, is ensuring that those communities, which are often the last to have, um, for example, employment opportunities, are trained, are paid, um, and have opportunities as a result of uh, these activities. There's some key questions here that I, I, I just put, not for us to necessarily talk about today, because I'm not sure we have time unless we want to do in the Q&A, um, but in many countries, CLM is being implemented in a manner that is out of step with the guidance that we've we've put. What solutions, how do we remedy this? How do we bridge those gaps? Um, how do we address challenging operating environments? I mentioned, for example, the case of MSM in, in Malawi, but you know there, there are lots of... Um, issues with criminalization and stigma and discrimination, you know, and, and, and they make CLM harder, right? We, we want to, to document evidence and we want peer monitors to be out in the field openly and transparently. And, and if, if those populations are criminalized, that makes it very difficult. And how do we um, support contexts where communities are partially but not fully leading to become um, in charge and independent? And here is a, a really, I think, maybe relevant for this region as well is we have, for example, the Global Fund in their last funding round, they had community-based monitoring. So you have a lot of CBM programs and now they've switched to CLM type models. And so they're, they've basically just rebranded it and they're trying to push, they've got guidance about what CLM means for them. Um, but you've got a lot of great implementers who are CB, community-based monitors who, 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 um, who are now potentially um, seeing that work taken away. How do we, how do we, um, how do we make that transition in a way that doesn't penalize some? I mentioned um, the progression matrix, and this will be my last point. The progression matrix was just um, was was developed by UNAIDS um, in response to what we were seeing going on, on the ground. And a lot of people were saying, oh, well, we, 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 we were only working with two clinics or um, communities aren't really leading. So that's not CLM. And what we wanted to move away from is a point in time approach. Uh, where someone was dismissing a program to a much more reflective conversation, bringing partners together, thinking about the progress of their CLM programs over time. And you won't be able to read all of this right now, uh, but what the idea is we've got 
seven variables on the left hand column here so that's the vertical column and community leadership monitoring scope of monitoring geographical coverage data collection management analysis so the, the nuts and bolts of how you do uh, data collection and then CLM data is strategic information, how you use that data, advocacy and sustainability. And then we've got six stages uh, at the top. So one is if you're off the matrix, so you you, you haven't quite, um, you, your program, your monitoring program, it doesn't really meet the characteristics that we've set forth. Then you've got basic and pilot refinement and insight stage. And these would see early CLM programs where you, you've got the elements of a CLM program, but the things may not be fully functional. Uh, systematization and consolidation stage, which is where we're seeing programs, a lot of programs are right now, that they, they they have some really strong elements, they're still trying to consolidate uh, their progress at the institutionalization stage. And, and I think one of the big issues with institutionalization is, is you know, as CLM programs become bigger and stronger, uh, and, and um, how, how the relationship with the government and, and also the funding sources become really critical. Um, but the idea with the progression matrix is, is that on at least an annual basis, you reflect on as partners where you are in terms of your progress. And you set, you obviously have an honest conversation about where you are, even if it's in the red or certain elements are in the red. But the focus is how do we move to, to, to the green? How do we move to the right of this um, uh, of this matrix? And so the hopefully that then helps planning in terms of how you do that transition over a year or two um, to achieve better CLM programs. So this is what an analysis might look like in a hypothetical, uh, looking at the, the seven variables and, and progress um, with the uh, the blue, the, the, sorry, the purple line being where, where, where we are today and the red being the, the plan, the target, the what we want to try and achieve. And then you can go through the detailed planning of, of how you actually achieve that moving forward. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for the time. Sorry, um, I went a little bit over, but uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, a framework for how we look at CLM, how um, you can reflect on those programs moving forward. Um, and also given some of you may not yet be at the point of implementation, where CLM fits within um, your strategies moving forward, if at all. Thank you.